My name is Dr. Tazeen Rahman, and I'm a rheumatologist in uh, private practice in Baltimore, Maryland. I was asked to present something from my specialty, and it decided on um, a topic uh, called Raynaud's phenomenon, which is a pretty common presentation uh, we see in consult in our um, in our practice. So uh, let's start. So uh, Raynaud's phenomenon is an exaggerated vascular response to typically a cold stimulus or emotional stress. So we can broadly classify Raynaud's phenomenon into two different types. There is a primary Raynaud's phenomenon and a secondary Raynaud's phenomenon. So primary Raynaud's phenomenon is the type where there is usually no underlying cause identified for the vascular event. This is typically seen in women and usually at a younger age, between 15 to 30 years of age. And it can also be seen in multiple family members. Secondary Raynaud's phenomenon, on the other hand, is usually occurring secondary to an underlying disease. And um, these underlying conditions that cause the Raynaud's phenomenon could either be autoimmune diseases, um, most commonly scleroderma, lupus, or Sjogren's. Certain drugs or toxins can also precipitate Raynaud's phenomenon. And more common medications may be like amphetamines or even some chemotherapeutic drugs and certain toxins. Then hematological disorders like uh, cryoglobulinemias, paraproteinemias can also trigger or cause secondary Raynaud's phenomenon. And thyroid disease, particularly hypothyroidism, can also predispose to it. And improvement of this cold-induced vasospasm can occur with thyroid hormone replacement. So this um, picture tells us the sequence of events that happen in Raynaud's phenomenon. So the first phase is typically called the ischemic phase, or it's also called the cold attack. And what happens is that there's going to be vasospasm of the artery, which results in occlusion of the blood supply to the affected area. The blood supply is impeded, and that results in ischemia of the area. In a white or pale margin, um, or the cyanotic phase, where because of the vasospasm, the capillaries and the venules in that affected area will dilate in response to the ischemia and they get filled with deoxygenated blood. This Phase one and phase two typically last anywhere from about 15 to 20 minutes. And then these are followed by phase three, in which there is a flushing or erythema of the area because of the relaxation of the vasospasm and then greatly increased blood flow to the area with oxygenated blood. So this, this is the picture uh, which is showing you how Raynaud's phenomenon occurs. And as you can see, it is a white and very pale discoloration of the fingers, and there's a sharply demarcated margin. So it usually starts in one digit, and then it spreads to involve the other digits. And in primary Raynaud's phenomenon, where there is no underlying cause, it typically is very symmetric in both hands. And it would start in in, the, in one finger, um, the index, middle, and ring fingers are most commonly involved. And as you can see, the thumb is typically spared in patients with primary Raynaud's phenomenon. In secondary Raynaud's phenomenon, it may be asymmetrical and the thumb may also be involved. This is a picture of the cyanotic phase or the blue phase where you would have more deoxygenated blood in the area. And then there are some patients with Raynaud's phenomenon that would, in, that would experience complaints which are resulting from low blood flow or ischemia. And the ischemia that happens, that could either be acute or it could be chronic. So acute is when it occurs for a short period of time 
Um, and that can manifest uh, with different symptoms. It could be numbness or tingling in the area, extreme cold hands or feet, and it can also present with um, clumsiness of the hand or aching in the hand. And then chronic ischemia is when these um, lack of blood supply, it happens for a prolonged period of time and resulting in uh, loss of um, the damage to the tissue in the area. And sometimes you can also have chronic ischemia with superimposed, uh, chronic ischemia with superimposed acute ischemic changes. So this is um, a picture of a hand of a patient who has scleroderma, and um, you can see digital pits or ulcerations that have formed because of the lack of the blood supply in the fingers. This is a picture of um, what we call libido reticularis. So this can also be seen during the cold response in patients with Raynaud's phenomenon. And it is a violicious and mottled or reticular, like a lacy pattern, which is seen over the skin. And in primary Raynaud's phenomenon, these circles which are formed, they are closed circles. And this is completely reversible when the Raynaud's phenomenon goes away. And uh, it's reversible with rewarming. But uh, non-reversible libido reticularis may be observed in patients with other secondary causes like vasculitis, occlusive vascular diseases, uh, conditions like antiphospholipid antibody syndrome. And in those cases, this libido tends to be more persistent and it doesn't form uh, closed circles. There may be broken circles that are formed in that condition. So sites of involvement. So Reynolds typically affects the hands and sometimes the feet, although usually the patients don't notice changes in the feet as much as they do in the hands. And in the hands, it tends to involve mostly the index, middle, and the ring fingers, and the thumb is typically spared. Um, other parts of the body that may be involved include the ears, the nose, face, knees, and even the nipples. So triggers for Raynaud's phenomenon. The most common trigger for Raynaud's phenomenon is cold. And this could either be um, a sudden change in temperature, like going from a warmer environment to a sudden exposure to a cold environment. It could also be if someone's sitting directly under um, in the draft of air conditioning, or for example, if you get an ice cold drink from the refrigerator, your hand will be exposed to that sudden cold and that can trigger it. Similarly, if you're grabbing something from the freezer section of the grocery store, you could precipitate and attack that way. And then the cold, um, it can also be a, a general body chill, uh, which can trigger an episode. It does not necessarily have to be that your hands and feet are cold only. So even if your hands and feet are kept warm, but your core temperature drops, you can trigger an attack. So it's very important to teach patients that they have to keep the core temperature warm in order to avoid uh, triggering their Raynaud's. Then um, an attack of Raynaud's can also occur after stimulation of uh, sympathetic nervous system, such as someone emotional stress or someone sudden startling, or that can trigger this attack. Caffeine or excess, uh, excessive, uh, excessive caffeine or smoking can also be triggers for Raynaud's. So evaluation and diagnosis. So uh, I've, the evaluation involves three main screening questions. So the first one is, are your fingers unusually sensitive to cold? Number two, do your fingers change colors when they're exposed to cold temperatures? And number three, do your fingers turn white, blue, or both? So Raynaud's phenomenon would be diagnosed if the patient has a positive response to all three questions. And this is important because a lot of times patients get referred with the diagnosis of Raynaud's phenomenon, and they would say, I have Raynaud's and because I have very sensitive hands and uh, I'm, I'm very sensitive to uh, cold in my hands and my feet, but they would not have the color changes with cold exposure. So you need to have the sensitivity to the cold, the color changes, as well as the white and the blue discoloration that should um, 
that you go with it in order to make a diagnosis of brain also. So the evaluation is basically um, involves a thorough history, a physical exam, and some diagnostic tools like nail cord kibbleroscopy. And the reason we want to evaluate and diagnose it is um, to basically be able to differentiate primary versus secondary Raynaud's phenomenon. So in the history, it's very important to focus on certain things. Um, age, for example. So primary Raynaud's phenomenon is usually seen between the ages of 15 and 30 years of age, and it's more common in women, while secondary would uh, be more common after the age of 40. So the age can sometimes point us in the direction of what kind of Raynaud's phenomenon the, the person is experiencing. Similarly, the sites of involvement. So um, primary Raynaud's phenomenon would be more symmetric involvement of um, like bilateral hands and feet. Um, the thumb is typically spared in primary Raynaud's phenomenon, although it may be involved in secondary Raynaud's phenomenon. So the sites of the involvement and the cemetery also has a clue of what kind of problem we are dealing with. Similarly, for um, primary Raynaud's phenomenon is usually mild, and these patients do not experience the um, ischemia or the soft tissue damage that can be seen in secondary disorders. So findings of digital ulcers and uh, severe disease is also usually indicative for uh, a secondary process. Um, then on history, we should try to like look for symptoms of autoimmune disease, particularly look for symptoms suggestive of scleroderma or lupus or Sjogren's, which are commonly seen associated with Raynaud's phenomenon. And then trying to find out triggers like various drugs or toxins, which can sometimes make even primary Raynaud's phenomenon worse later in life. On physical exam, we would focus on looking for any digital pits or ulcers. We look for sclerodactyly, any inflamed joints, skin rashes, or anything that would point towards an underlying cause for this Raynaud's phenomenon. Diagnostic tools like nail fold kibbleroscopy can be done in the clinic, the bedside, and can provide a lot of diagnostic clues. So um, nail fold uh, kibbleroscopy basically drop oil on the periungal area and you examine with a ophthalmoscope, which is set at a diopter of 40. Um, or you could also use um, uh, like uh, special capillaroscopes can be used um, to examine. And this is a picture which is showing you what the nail pole um, capillaries look like. So in normal, you will have a very symmetric uh, appearance to the capillaries, but as the disease progresses and um, advances, you would see more dilated loops of the capillaries and then you would see frequent dropouts, uh, which would be more indicative of autoimmune disease. This is a picture of um, a normal, um, uh, what a normal nail fold uh, capillary pattern would look like. These are some others which are showing uh, more dilated loops in the second one. And in the third and the fourth picture, you can see um, abnormal pattern with, um, uh, with frequent dropouts. So the workup would include um, labs. So if you are if you find something on the history or the physical exam that raises concern for an underlying autoimmune disease, you would go ahead and check blood work. And typically blood work um, would be uh, blood tests like ANA, uh, which is the anti-neutrophilic antibody. You can uh, check blood work for scleroderma like SCL70, anti-centromere antibody, and an RNP polymerase, et cetera. If no underlying autoimmune cause is identified, then it's important to look for other causes for Raynaud's phenomena. For example, thyroid disease or um, malignancy and a vascular workup looking for either atherombolic disease, et cetera, that can be undertaken. So this table just shows up uh, the how you distinguish primary from secondary Raynaud's phenomenon. So primary, like I mentioned, usually occurs between the ages of 15 to 30 years of age and more common in female and um, tends to have more symmetric um, involvement with uh, sparing of the thumbs. While in secondary Raynaud's phenomenon, you usually see this above the age of 40 years and more common in males. And uh, the pattern of involvement is typically asymmetric. 
In primary Raynaud's phenomenon on history, you are not going to see any signs or symptoms of autoimmune disease. There's going to be no signif uh, significant findings of ischemia like um, you know, like digital pits or ulcers, and the nail fold capillaries would be normal. Also, blood work would be normal in patients with primary Raynaud's phenomenon. Well, in secondary Raynaud's phenomenon, these patients would have some signs and symptoms of autoimmune disease. You would see um, abnormal exam like uh, ulcers and pits, um, digital pits um, on the digits, um, on the fingertips, and uh, abnormal nail fold capillaries and abnormal labs. So um, what are the mimickers or something, some conditions that can cause confusion with uh, primary Raynaud's phenomenon? So um, occlusive vascular disease is one of, them, one of them. So in occlusive vascular disease, this could be either embolic disease or in, even um, uh, thrombotic uh, thrombosis, atherosclerosis, even Verger's disease. They can cause either a cold limb, um, or a single digit in the hand or the foot can, uh, can have ischemia and damage. And as you can see, these tend to be asymmetric, a single digit would be involved. And um, the vasospasm that's typically irreversible with critical tissue ischemia. And patient, you would do more vascular studies to identify the underlying cause. Acrocinosis is a functional peripheral vascular disorder, which is characterized by a symmetrical, painless, and um, there's a persistent bluish discoloration of the hands and the feet. And this tends to get worse with cold exposure. Now, you're not going to see the pale phase in acrocinosis that you would typically see in a, in a patient with the Raynaud's phenomenon. So, um, but sometimes um, if you have a Raynaud's phenomenon, which is superimposed on acrocinosis, um, it may be difficult to distinguish the two disorders. Erythromyalgia. Erythromyalgia is an exaggerated, like a blushing of the skin. And this can um, mimic the recovery phase or the hyperemic phase of Raynaud's phenomenon. But in contrast to Raynaud's, the um, vasodilatation that occurs in erythromyalgia, it tends to get worse by exposure to warm temperature. And these patients feel better by keeping the extremities cool. And then complex regional pain syndrome, that is um, a disorder of a body region, usually involving either the hands or the feet. And these patients usually present with um, some kind of vasomotor instability. They'll have a color change of the involved area. They may be swelling, change in uh, temperature, some paresthesias. And then they may also develop muscle over time. And then you don't... Um, you don't see that muscle atrophy and rain on. And um, the pain is usually persistent and, and it's continuous and doesn't have the intermittent nature that you would see with rain on. Now treatment. So the treatment can be, um, is usually the first step is non-pharmacological measures. So the most important thing is to um, educate the patient um, on what kind of triggers will cause um, worsening or precipitate an attack. So the most common trigger is cold. So like I mentioned before, it's very important to maintain your core temperature. So just keeping your hands and your feet warm is not going to prevent an attack of Raynaud's. You have to dress in layers. You have to keep your core temperature warm because if you get a general body chill, and even if your hands and feet are warm, you will still get Raynaud's. So, um, you know, be careful when you're like grabbing things from the refrigerator or going uh, from um, an inside warm environment to a cold environment, uh, stuff like that. You should uh, keep your core temperature in addition to your hands and feet warm. Similarly, stress can uh, stimulate the sympathetic nervous system, which tends to trigger Raynaud's. So try and minimize um, sudden exposure to stress. Um, smoking should be avoided and excess caffeinated uh, drinks should also be avoided because they can also trigger Raynaud's. Um, 
there are certain medications, generally any kind of vasoconstricting drugs like um, cold medications, some ADHD medications, um, certain diet pills, some uh, chemotherapeutic drugs, beta blockers, et cetera, which can also cause worsening of the brain nodes. Um, avoid repeated trauma to the fingertips, specifically using any uh, tool that has vibration in it can trigger the, the brain nodes as well. As far as pharmacological measures are concerned, the most commonly used first line agents are calcium channel blockers. So cal calcium channel blockers, um, you could either use something like um, lorapine or nifedipine, which will help to vasodilate the area. Um, Phosphodiesterase inhibitors like sildenafil are also commonly used in, in patients who either don't tolerate or don't respond to first-line agents like calcium channel blockers. And then options for patients who are unable to take medications orally. Um, and the, you usually use the topical nitrate ointment in between the webs of the fingers, just um, either prophylactically, like prior to um, being exposed to a trigger or periodically throughout the day to help um, prevent the Raynaud's from coming on. Other medications are angiotensin II receptor blockers or ser selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors, and sometimes combination therapies can be used. Now, there are tre treatment for refractory Raynaud's. So if, if the non-pharmacological measures and the first-line pharmacological measures do not work, or if the patient experiences acute ischemia and um, significant damage to a limb or a digit, then there are other measures that have to be taken. These patients may require hospitalization. They have to be kept warm, warm and dry. Pain control is a really important part because the area that is ischemic will be extremely painful. Anticoagulation is sometimes used until we have ruled out any underlying clotting issue. Um, and sometimes intravenous prostaglandins like epoprostenol or iloprost may be used. Um, patients who either don't tolerate these measures or don't respond to them, or if these measures like IV prostaglandins, et cetera, are not available, then other things like local or regional block, uh, digital sympathectomy, et cetera, can be used. So now let's finish this by going over a case. So it's, this is a 25-year-old female with complaints of fatigue and cold fingers. She is healthy. She has no past medical history. She does not take any uh, medications. Um, she has a family history of a maternal aunt with history of lupus. She does not smoke and she does not drink excessive um, caffeinated beverages. So she has an office job. And she's been under stress and sleeping poorly and drinking excessive caffeine recently. Now she reports bluish color change of her hands and feet bilaterally with cold. Her fingers are very sensitive to cold as well. She denies any symptoms of autoimmune disease like arthralgias, skin rashes, and oral ulcers, etc. Nail fold capillary, uh, capillary exam that you perform at the bedside is completely normal. The exam shows no evidence of any digital ulcers or sclerodactyly. So this patient likely has primary Raynaud's phenomenon. She's 25 years old. She is, she is in that age range that we would expect one to have primary Raynaud's. She is describing uh, very classic symptoms for Raynaud's, uh, which include sensitivity to cold and change in temperature, uh, a change in color of her fingers with cold exposure, including either whitish or bluish discoloration. And um, she does not have any symptoms of underlying um, either autoimmune disease or abnormal nail fold capillaries. So this patient you would educate uh, with um, lifestyle measures, non-pharmacological treatment options. And typically patients um, with uh, primary Raynaud's will have um, improvement in the quality of life and reduction in the frequency of these episodes by just con conservative measures. Um, or non-pharmacological measures. I would not recommend any further treatment, uh, any further workup for this patient as the concern for an underlying secondary cause is very low. So I hope that was helpful. And um, 
that in future, if you have any patient who's complaining of either excessive cold hands or color changes, that you're able to differentiate whether that patient needs any additional workup, whether that patient needs to be referred to a rheumatologist for further workup, because sometimes Raynaud's phenomenon can be the first sign of an autoimmune disease, um, particularly in patients like uh, with autoimmune disease like sclerosis. Derma, um, Raynaud's phenomenon could present two or three years prior to manifestation of uh, the autoimmune disease um, or clinical features of that disease. So uh, thank you so much. And um, uh, I hope that um, this will provide you some, um, help you with your uh, experience in your clinical practice in the future.